this week on the Back Table Podcast. Once you make that jump to being an entrepreneur, your relationship with your institution can change overnight. And where I was a researcher who could have my own IRBs and be the PI and investigate, and I didn't realize this would happen, but suddenly the IRB is like, well, wait, you have equity stake in this thing? Well, you can no longer oversee any research. And that is, it's an obvious now if you look into it, but at the time that, was, that came as a surprise. And it became very difficult to continue to do the research on the app internally without a whole bunch of red tape, paperwork, and expense. And although I, you know, I guess I wouldn't change things because things worked out okay, but it's taken longer to make the jump. Like I wish I could have been able to because I think I would have made a better product earlier if I had had more time to tinker with it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with a hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. This is Brian Hartley as your host this week. I'm a radiologist living in Nashville and co-founder of an early stage device company in the pulmonary space. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest this week, Dr. Alex Langerman. Dr. Langerman is a practicing head and neck surgeon at Vanderbilt, so he's a colleague. His research focuses on the intersection of ethics, performance, and data science in the operating room. He's a sought-after speaker and author on topics of surgical ethics, video and data recording in the operating room, operating room efficiency, and clinical care of head and neck cancer patients. So while at the University of Chicago, Dr. Langerman co-founded Explorer Surgical, a startup based on his research and focused on real-time surgical data collection. Explorer was actually acquired in 2021 by GHX Medical. So congrats to Dr. Langerman on that. So welcome, Alex, and thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's it's great to have you here. So uh, why don't we start off, you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and then we'll get into kind of how you decided to become a ENT. Yeah, well, you know, I appreciate your summing it up at the beginning. I am a practicing surgeon. It's perhaps how I define myself. When you think about your self-image, it's just something that I've totally fell in love with from before medical school. Kind of the reason wow. I went to medical school is because I wanted to be a surgeon and I got to do it. It's such a dream come true. And, and I love it, taking care of patients and it, it just keeps me going. And it's the, one of the big motivators in my life. And I moved down to uh, Nashville uh, in 2015. I'd done some training here in 2010 for a little while, saw a little bit of the old Nashville before coming back to see it rapidly changing and continuing to change in amazing ways, uh, which you can appreciate too. And, you know, I'm a dad and I have two wonderful little kids and an amazing wife and now a little puppy ah, just joined us too. So. Nice. What kind of puppy? <laughs> what kind of puppy did you get? It's, it was, it's a Swiss doodle. It's some oh, kind nice. of combo, Bernadoodle, Aussie doodle combo. And uh, it's just a awesome dog ball of fluff probably yeah just ball of fluff and it likes mountains you know it likes to run around it's 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 cool awesome awesome well fun fact you and i actually met at the food and wine festival in nashville for the first time if you remember that i think you and had it was the first food and wine festival yeah that's right it was, it was the inaugural one where they were just giving away all the swag which was incredible but yeah, I remember just bumping into you and then finding out you were a surgeon, you were starting at Vandy, and you were an entrepreneur too. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. We had so many overlaps. It was perfect. I know. That's right. That's right. So cool. Awesome. Well, how did you get into ENT? It sounds like you love surgery early on, but ENT is very unique and specifically head and neck, which from my opinion, going through med school, seeing residency, doing radiology, those are some big cases. You know, that was always the big cases when you, uh, the head and neck surgeon. So how'd you get into that? Well, you know, initially when I came to medical school, you're influenced by your surroundings, right? And I had looked to do some research and ended up in an immunology lab and spent five years in that lab, including one, one year as a Howard Hughes fellow oh, cool. studying T-cell immunotherapy. Yeah, it was, it was great. I learned a ton about science from there. And I had a wonderful mentor, Mike Nishimura, who just taught me to be a good thinker and careful with my data and have extreme integrity. It was, a, it was an important person in my life. And because of the immunology transplant overlap, I was like, I'm going to be a transplant surgeon. I'm like, this is amazing stuff, right? You get to take a body part from one person and put it in another person and, and save their lives. And it's magic. It is magic. It is magic. And so I was certain I was going to do that. And my girlfriend at the time was kind of anti the lifestyle that a transplant surgeon leaves, which, uh, 
can't imagine why. Yeah, I, I know. And admittedly, I think it's gotten better for that specialty, but it, it's, a, it's a tough lifestyle, right? Because there's always that in the moment, you need to head somewhere and go do something huge. So there was that. And then I had a, a transplant surgeon who was a mentor of mine and I affiliated with the lab. And I told him that I, you know, I was like, I, I think I want to be a transplant surgeon. And he got right up in my, like, like an inch from my face and said, are you sure? And I w- I was like, uh, maybe, maybe I'm not no, sure. Okay, I guess that. I'm not. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not sure. Clearly, you are mm. sure that I should not be sure. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and so that those were the the girlfriend and the and this this interaction opened my mind a little bit to say, well, what else is out there? And then, uh, you know, again, a little bit of a serendipity, I suppose, is the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, article came out that was about laryngeal transplantation. So transplanting the larynx. And it was performed by otolaryngologists, you know, head and neck surgeons. And I, I was sort of like, who are these people? And I, I started interacting. I said, well, let me go check out their clinic. And so I went to the clinic and I just found the, the otolaryngologist at University of Chicago, where I ended up doing my training. I was a medical student there too, while I was a medical student. And they, they were incredibly warm, welcoming, fun. They enjoyed these awesome cases. It seemed like but people were just happy doing their job. And I was like, well, this isn't, this is refreshing, you know? And, and, you know, I, I had always thought it was tubes and tonsils, you know, and in fact, head and neck surgeons do, you know, huge procedures. We get to use a lot of cool equipment. And we also, this is sort of a, the wannabe pathologist nerd in me, but we operate on every tissue type in the body, which is its own sort of interesting thing. Cause you see all sorts of different pathology. And, you know, my career has waxed and waned as to what I do a lot of, you know, depending on where I practice and just over time growing my practice, you know, some things grow more than others, but it continues to be challenging and interesting. And I love it. Uh, I like taking care of the people. It's very rewarding. Yeah. Like I said, those are big cases. The, you know, I didn't really have a full understanding until you're in med school and you're rounding on some of those patients. You're just like, holy cow, you know, that's a big surgery. And Follow-up can be really tough, especially a lot of those patients that get radiation and have mucositis. That's a that's tough. And the changes to their, you know, the basic functions, right? Swallowing, mm-hmm. yeah. speaking, eating, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it takes a, a compassionate person to do that. There's no doubt about it. So that's awesome. And how did you get involved in entrepreneurship in general? Did you always want to be an entrepreneur or is this something like, how did that little spark start inside of you to be like, I like improving things or solving problems. Yeah. You know, so accidental. It's funny. I didn't actually realize this until well into my road down entrepreneurship that I was talking to a mentor who was a a experienced uh, venture capitalist. And he had asked me what my parents did. And, you know, my my dad had died many years ago. You know, I said, well, you know, he, my dad had started out as a drug salesman for Bayer Aspirin. He was sales manager for, oh, wow. like, of all things. Wow. Right? He was, he was, you he need was, a salesman he, for Bayer Aspirin. Right. And yeah. I mean, he was, he was born in 1924. So it, it was, uh, uh, he was older when he had me. And, um, and then he moved up to another drug company and then ultimately started his own company, Windmill Vitamins. And this mentor of mine comments, oh, he was an entrepreneur. And I was like, oh, yeah. I guess he was. And admittedly, you know, he, you know, there was ups and downs with his job. And there were times when he was a really good salesman and a really nice, honest dude, loved, beloved by kind of everybody. And he had some business partners that I think were a little bit more cutthroat. And I saw that like interaction. And I think I had a very negative impression of the business world as a result of that. And in fact, it was sort of like, I don't think I could do that, be in that world. It was, it was very intimidating to me. And, uh, I've since grown a lot as a human being and then seen a lot of different examples of how people can be in business. And it's, it's, you know, it's a a part of the, of the ecosystem that keeps this world going and and part of what delivers huge value to patients, you know? So, so uh, I say I learned differently, but I think when I was younger, that was something that that world seemed very scary to me. Um, like a place you could get taken advantage of, you know, a place you could lose a lot of money yep. and uh, unsafe, that kind of thing. And so all not sure. They're not wrong. <laughs> no, <laughs> those, no, those things not. are they're not wrong. Not. Important cause. Just like in medicine, you can kill somebody. If you screw up, you can make huge devastating things to other people and things that will weigh on your conscious forever if you're not careful. And there's those risks to every endeavor. So anyways, that's me going into this where I didn't really 
think about that as a viable pathway. And I left my fellowship here at Vanderbilt. I left my fellowship with this plan of studying how patients perceived treatment options vis-a-vis things that they value. Sort of wearing my ethics hat, I had thought a lot about, well, you know, what are the things that are important to patients? And at the time, there was a paradigm shift happening in the treatment of oropharyngeal cancer. We had recently discovered the connection between uh, human papillomavirus and tonsil throat cancer. And these are patients who actually could be cured more readily. And the options were really, do you do surgery and then maybe radiation, or do you do chemo radiation up front? That pathway seemed to be driven by who the patient saw first more than anything. And I thought maybe there's a different way to do it. And I, I recruited a mentor, an oncologist at University of Chicago, and just went after it with like writing a K award. Nine months, I had written a, a K application, which got scored on the first, you know, it didn't get scored high enough for the pay line, but it got scored. And I was like, you know, this is my path, right? I'm going to get the K, then I'm going to get the R, and then I'm gonna this, you know, funded researcher. So you're the, the research path, what you're saying. Yeah. Research path, right. And then in the time between the getting the feedback on my first application and the resubmission, my mentor left the institution for this project. One of the national trial organizations proposed a clinical trial that was very similar to what I was proposing on like more of a local level. Right. You know, and I mean, it's because it was an obvious trial. I mean, you know, I just yeah. it sort of worked it out was that coming. way. And yeah. yeah, it was coming. Right. And so, and they were going to be able to do it better, right? Because it was a national trial. And suddenly this K award became this thing I had to do. And it was just this terrible burden on me. I was losing sleep over it, worrying about it. And how am I going to find a path? How am I going to salvage this? And it started getting so far afield that that uh, one of my surgical mentors, who is a clinical trialist, you know, was kind enough to sort of sit down for a couple hours with me on the phone and talk me through the whole project. And the end of it, he goes, "You know, I don't, I don't know why a surgeon would be doing this project. This is so far outside because it was a lot about chemo and radiation. It was a lot about things that were not related to the surgical care of patients. Not that surgeons can't be involved in that, but it was like." The whole thing was about that, and there was no surgery involved. And he said, you know, it's, it seems like you're trying to stretch yourself beyond what what is your domain of experience. And that was in, influential, of course. The other part of it was at the same time, I had had this wonderful medical student named Emily Stocker, who had an MBA. And she had come to me as a medical student to say, hey, I heard you're, you know, like uh, interesting uh, attending to do research with, you know, I was... I'm trying to come up with a research project that would leverage my MBA, you know, let's, um, what projects do you have? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't know yet, but let's tour the operating room and let's think about ways to make it better. And I was primed for that because when I had finished my fellowship and started as an attending, I kept feeling like, gosh, my OR is so inefficient. Like the things that I need aren't there. And it doesn't seem, it seems like I'm constantly working uphill to get, you know, the patient care done. It's taking longer than I think. Everything's he's setting up slowly, you know, all the things. And this was nothing to knock the team that I was working with. I was like, there's something, I'm doing something wrong. You know, that was that was my perception. And so I had a, a very special opportunity granted to me by the University of Chicago to tour the country and spend time with luminaries in my field to see how they handled their operating room. What I discovered was, although they, I learned all sorts of amazing things about how people do operations differently or different tricks and techniques they use or strategies for thinking about how to improve the operation. I was also noticing that a lot of the problems I was experiencing in the University of Chicago were common to the hospitals I was visiting. You know, even the famous people had trouble. And, you know, reflecting back, Vanderbilt had similar challenges. And I think during my fellowship, I was so focused on the surgical side of things rather than running the OR that I didn't pay attention to it. And so, this is going around in my head. And, and so I'm taking Emily through the, the ORs and we walk into one of my colleagues' operating rooms and he's doing a thyroidectomy. And she she's asking me questions about everything she's saying. And she says, wow, they use all those instruments for this operation. You know, there's four trays of instruments, a couple hundred stainless steel items sitting out there on the table. And I was like, <laughs> you know, silly medical student, you know, what do you know? No, no, we probably use, you know, 10 or 12 of them for this operation. And she said, wow, that, that seems really wasteful. And I was like, oh my goodness, it does. 
And, you know, I, I'm convinced that when you're trying to become a surgeon, and maybe it's just me because I was so like, I want to be a surgeon. But I think there's something about being in the operating room that to get to do the thing, like the big thing. The big show in the operating room is that person who's operating, right? And to get to do that thing, you have to follow all of these rules and do it like they do. And so it it breeds out a little bit of a questioning mind and more of a a hierarchical sort of following mind, I think. You know, if you're constantly trying to follow what everyone else does rather than go against whatever the norm is. And it was Emily's fresh eyes that opened my eyes to the the inefficiencies of the operating room. I'm... I owe her such a debt of gratitude, and she she knows that, because it, it really changed my thinking. And ultimately, throughout my career, I've spent a lot of time bringing outsiders into the OR and have worked on methods for making that happen, you know, even uh, in a virtual digital manner, because it that that improves the the sterility worries, that improves the logistics of it if you can just sort of drop in and see and help. But it also brings all of these brains in that know about things that we don't know about as surgeons and nurses and anesthesiologists that can make the operating room better and patient care better. And that's that's been a sort of a theme through my including uh, honestly, including patients too. I think patients could have a lot to say about what we do in the operating room that, you know, because they're asleep, we don't really get their opinion. And so that's just really been something that motivates me. So that's huge. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a really great. That's a great point. I love the fact that she saw something. I think when you said the questioning mind versus the hierarchical mind, and I think we're all trained in medicine in the, mainly the hierarchical way of thinking, right? We're trained that this is the way you do it. And it's been done this way for a long time. And don't question it. You need to hit all these steps right. There's too many things you need to keep in your mind to question anything. And that just, it really can narrow your possibilities for improvement. There's benefits, right? There's huge benefits. You don't stray off track when that happens. So that is like a pre-flight checklist, right? No one questions a pre-flight checklist. Should we be doing that? Why? Because it is designed that way. It's designed to be kind of self-enclosed and... You don't want to deviate from that, but bringing in people who do not think that way can have huge impact. And I love that you were just like, that's crazy. Yes, this is how we do it. Obviously, little med student, you didn't understand, but good on you to be like, wait a minute, is she actually right? No, she's right. I think think a lot of people would have just been like, no, 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 no. Of course, we don't use all those, but we need them just in case. We need them just in case, you know, something comes up. Oh, yeah. And that could have been the right answer right then. I mean, I don't think anybody would have faulted you for saying that. And in fact, I think probably eight out of 10 people would have been like, well, you never know what tools you're going to need. That's right. That is, in fact, the strategy over provisioning in the operating room. And yet at the same time, is it really right? You know, it may be right on one level, but is it right on a higher level? The, the number of things that you need at hand in two seconds is limited. Yeah. But certainly there's there needs to be, and this is part of a larger you know ecosystem change in the operating room, but there needs to be a way to efficiently get the things that you might need available to you while not... Wasting them or bringing them and opening them or... Exactly. You open a disposable, it gets thrown out. You open a reusable, it has to get re-sterilized. And that all comes with a cost. And in fact... That was the project that Emily and I worked on, and it's been a paper that's been cited quite a bit in the business world. I've had people, you know, pitching me ideas who quote the paper to me, not realizing I wrote the paper. You know, they're like, well, the study out of the University of Chicago, yeah. you know, such and such said that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I wrote that paper. Mic drop. I love that. Yeah. So at that point, you said this, there is waste here. And what happened after that? You went and toured. First off, I love that you went and actually val... So... The way I see this is you found a clinical, you went looking for clinical needs in the OR. You found one with the help of a medical student, a very smart medical student. And then you went, you didn't stop there and say, hey, this must be the problem. You said, well, we better validate this. We better make sure this is actually happening in other places. Because a lot of surgeons probably would have been like, this must be it. You know, and that's where you can fall into a lot of problems is not validating your clinical need. And it sounds like you went and did that. So what made you say, you know what, we should probably make sure this is an issue? I credit uh, some really important mentors, David Song, John Alverdi, and Jeff Matthews, who were leaders in the Department of Surgery at University of Chicago, I guess saw something in me to, they basically proposed to me, maybe you should make a lab that studies the operating room. You should work on 
these kind of issues. And I think they'd seen some success I had with these, you know, my interests, the, the papers I'd started to write. And frankly, it was something where, you know, jumping back to that K award, unlike the K award, this was something I was doing in my spare time and was enjoying. And so when I finally decided to abandon the K award and this huge feeling of relief, I was still pursuing this other idea. Like, how do we make the ORs better? How do we make them more efficient and cost less and safer? How do we perform as surgeons better? You know, they, they let me found this lab and they, you know, I got some seed funding for it, you know, and more importantly, a space in our new brand new, uh, uh, it was perfect timing. It was a brand new giant inpatient and operating building at the university of Chicago, the center for care and discovery. And while the idea was being hatched, the building layout was, you know, being finalized, you know, where, where they were going to sign certain rooms to the building could be built. And they gave me this space right next to the operating rooms for a lab where there could actually be through traffic of the lab of anybody from the operating room. So we could go, you know, we go right to the operating room. We could also have people from the operating room, nurses, anesthesiologists, surgeons coming through the lab to interface with ideas that we were working on. Proximity was was helpful there. Huge. And and it's it's those chance and you know, when you read all the, you know, stories about like Bell Labs or What's uh, Pixar? And you learn about how the way that these ideas... Bill Gates, I guess, living in Silicon Valley. Um... Right, right. And how the, it's these chance interactions and, and co-localization made the, the difference. So when we founded this lab, and, and this is something that I don't even know how I came up with this idea or probably some mentor suggested in some way or read something, but this is the thing that I think if I could suggest to anyone to try, and this, this almost comes out of Steve Blank's playbook, although I didn't know about Steve Blank back then, I was like, all right, well, I want to make this lab that serves the operating room. So I scheduled a meeting with every department, like a Grand Rounds type meeting, you know, their Wednesday morning Grand Rounds. And, you know, I got up there and I said, hi, you know, my, my name's Alex Langerman and I'm, you know, the ENTs and, and I've got this new lab where we're studying the operating room. So what don't you like about the operating room? And it was like stunned silence because everyone is expecting a talk, like, you know, uh, a PowerPoint, something. And I just listened to people and you know it would take a moment and then someone would speak up and then like a bunch of hands would go up and everyone's just talking about people love to complain all the things they hate right and i just kept notes on all the things and that became our sort of roadmap of things we need to tackle things that we need to make better to start to find the needs that overlapped with not only the the clinicians but you know strategic sourcing you know the people who are purchasing all the stuff for the hospital and, and hospital administration and the nurses and the anesthesiologists and finding out, you know, where the overlapping pain points were. And, and that ultimately was what sort of drove the work that we did in the lab that ultimately led to the app that we commercialized. Awesome. I love that. I think you basically, you did the work is what it sounds like. You went out there and you asked other people if they had similar problems. And so basically what you're doing to me this whole time is a lot of the Stanford biodesign process. You went through by, fi you first start with needs finding and that starts with observation. And then you go through need validation where you take these problems that keep coming up and you make sure they're true problems. Are other people experiencing them? It, it's a better use of your time if you're going after problems that affect a large number of people. Okay, it's better for the world if you go after problems that are affecting a large number of people. And that's what it sounds like you went out and did. You made sure that was the case first. You did the work. You know, it's almost like grad school level work, researching all of these things, making sure you're, you're interviewing people, making sure there's a there there before you go out to solve a problem, which I think is fantastic. So how did it turn from research project to an actual funded, you know, we've got an idea here that could be commercialized? you know, again, chance encounter, right? So I'm in my lab and I'm like, I want to put up a website, you know, I'm going to start blogging about the OR and I'm going to have a, a, a site for my lab. And at any university, there's an administrative structure that decides how that happens. And the person who was sent to my lab was Chris Radell, who was himself an entrepreneur and really was in IT at University of Chicago, I think as, as like his day gig, you know, and he was sent to my lab to help talk through my needs for my website, right? And he's a really interesting guy and a real thoughtful guy. And so we got to talking about what I was working on in my lab and I lamented. I said, you know, the thing that I'm struggling with is where's the funding source for there? Where's the NIH RFP for, you know, something to improve the operating room? 
And I had to find some disease specific application to be able to go down that path. And he said, well, have you thought about this new innovation fund that's happening at, through the university? And I said, well, I, you know, I didn't know about it. You know, let me look into it. And, and so he, he recommended that and also connected me with the Booth School of Business had a program where business students interested in, in working on ideas could have a lunch and learn where people come from the you know, different parts of the institution and come over and talk about, you know, things that they're working on. And so, you know, I, I went to this lunch and learn and Jennifer Freed, who ultimately was my co-founder of the company was at this, this meeting. And I came and I was, I, I started with, okay, I got an idea. And this is funny because just as you said, the process of, you know, is there a need and that kind of thing. So the app that I developed, you know, Explorer, the Explorer app was very much built out of like, we found this need and then we were trying to solve this need and, you know, in an iterative process. And like anyone, you also kind of come up with these flash inspiration ideas. And I had this idea for something that would help manage all of the IVs that get tangled around patients. That's currently like they wrap tape around your arm, right? To, to hold it in place. And so I was, I was leading with my idea, you know, like, look at this problem, but really like, look at this idea. We need a thing. Look at this solution. Yeah. There it is. And we need this thing that can manage these cords and, you know, and every single patient who gets admitted to a hospital would need one. Imagine the market size would be amazing. Right. And so that there's a lot of kind of like, uh, you know, head shaking back and forth, uncertain, you know, and, and someone's like, well, how would you make it? What would it be like? And I'm like, well, that's the thing. We got to figure that out. But it would be this thing. It would clip to the arm and I have these ideas, but you know, whatever. And so I just falling like, you know, like a lead balloon. And the moderator says, why don't you tell them about this other thing you're working on? You know, nah. that, that, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know. Okay. I you know, love it. There's so uh, there's this app, you know, that it basically helps the OR become more efficient, save money. And like everybody sat forward. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and I talked and, you know, told him more about it. And Jen came up to me afterwards as well as another Booth student. And we, we talked and said, well, maybe you guys can help me a little bit and I'll pitch to this innovation fund. You know, so I, I did, you know, and I, I pitched this very big vision idea of how can we find a way to put something in the operating room that will call data about how to make it better? Because ultimately that was the biggest problem that you face when you're trying to make the OR better is it's very hard to collect data. And so I had this idea of a playbook that would help surgical teams, but in the process of helping the teams, it would generate data about what they were doing that could then be used to have more large scale interventions, have insight into the operating room, forecast surgical times, that kind of thing. That was the big vision. And I remember I put up the slide of the Google like homepage that shows just like the entry box. And I talked about how, you know, Google never asks you for anything. It just offers you, you know, answers, but the mere act of asking for things and what you do with that information has built all of their other services. They, it's not a have to Google's a get to, they're providing a service. And I said, and that's what I want to create for the operating room. And I have to say, I didn't actually succeed in that. Um, you know, well, that's the whole, well, that's how it works. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, but, but that's what we were ultimately going for. that's the idea that we sold, you know, when we got and, and also, and, and who knows, I'd read that specific numbers were good. So I asked for like $63,785 or something very specific. And I <laughs> I've don't learned math. that too. I don't know yeah. why I've learned that same thing too. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you need down to like dollars and the people are like, oh, you must have calculated this yeah. out. And admittedly I did, yeah. but, but I didn't, I didn't leave a lot of buffer. And, and then we took that idea sorry, that, that seed fund, we took that seed funds. And at the time, one of the people, one of the groups of people I've been bringing into the OR, you know, this is all connected here, mm -hmm. was where were students from the Institute of Design, Illinois Institute of Technology Institute of Design. It's a leading design school to rethink the operating room. And we did some fun projects together. There's some stuff online about redesigning the operating room that they produced as a result of those collaborations. And through them, I got connected with an interaction designer who had a consulting company and he basically kind of as a favor took a, you know, a decent sized chunk of that initial seed funding and completely designed the app to our specifications, you know, like created a logo for it, created a method of a working prototype of the app that we could use to test it. And that's how we ended up creating the app. That's how we ended up being able to use it. You know, it was something where it was an open framework that, that we could go in and modify ourselves. So he, had, he did a ton of work for us and it was admittedly an MVP, no question, but it had a lot of functionality for us to be able to modify it over time based on how people were interacting with it. And 
that's how we started testing it in the operating rooms. Wow. So then how did we become a company? There was a competition, the New Venture Challenge, and to enter the New Venture Challenge, which Jen Freed was the, our lead for it, she made my co-founder, you have to start a company. And she had a, a lawyer that she knew. She, was, she had come from v, the VC world before going to uh, business school. She had a, a lawyer she had worked with, and he agreed to provide us some initial services for you know equity and promises for future you know work and he was a very experienced entrepreneurship lawyer and you know and we sort of signed some documents and i remember my wife saying like wait did you just start a company without talking to me about it you incorporated yeah yeah and i was like oh i mean just for this comp ah, whatever yeah it's you know, like an sbir you i've got to do it it's just something you've got to do but you don't realize how it's psychologically it matters. It matters. I don't know to your identity, like you like you said, it's going back to the very beginning. Like, oh yeah, you kind of downplayed it, but you became an entrepreneur at that point, right? <laughs> we we did, and and you know the thing that was honestly so interesting, and you know I hope this will help some folks, is that once you make that jump to being an entrepreneur, your relationship with your institution can change overnight. And where I was a researcher who could have my own IRBs and be the PI and investigate, and I didn't realize this would happen, but suddenly the IRB is like, well, wait, you have equity stake in this thing? Well, you can no longer oversee any research. And that is, it's an obvious now if you look into it, but at the time that, was, that came as a surprise and it became very difficult to continue to do the research on the app internally without a whole bunch of red tape, paperwork, and expense. And although I, you know, I guess I wouldn't change things because things worked out okay, but it's taken longer to make the jump. Like I wish I could have been able to, because I think I would have made a better product earlier if I had had more time to tinker with it rather than saying, we have a product, like let's get it out there. Yeah. You, you know, I've seen that. I saw that at Stanford so many times. The advice we would get is if you can stay under the umbrella of a research project for longer using whatever internal funds or spark funds or anything, seed funds from the university, that is the way to do it because you're always, what I found is no product is perfect when you first come up with it, right? It always needs to be iterated and changed. And the longer you can do that, the more you can stretch that out without having to raise external capital. That's when, you know, things get tricky. When you raise external capital, a lot of institutions will say you, you got to get out the better sometimes. Now, there's a there's a flip side to that because it can slow you down too. If you get stuck in the research washer, you know, it can be very easy for momentum to take over and entropy and then you stay in the research land. It's a balance, but you're totally right. If you can stay in a little bit longer, you can squeeze a little bit more juice out of the, the research title, so to speak. Yeah, I'd be free to sort of fail a little bit. Without having investors that are, you know, in on it. Right, or a runway that you're running down. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, I mean, that's it's a scary time, you know. And I do think back to, you know, even the initial days of the, the lab, which was called the Operative Performance Research Institute. And, you know, Grand Ole Opry here in Nashville, I called it the uh, the brand new Opry, O-P-R-I, <laughs> in, in Chicago. And that, that our lab, a lot of it was... I had no grant deadline. I'd been, been internally funded to to spend some time in this. I mean, I think they gave me, you know, three or four years, right, to to work on it and to start to show some some benefit. And and well before that, I mean, I think one of our biggest projects saved six hundred and fifty thousand dollars of annual operating expenses just by improving preference cards and other little tiny interventions that just added up over case, over case, over case. What's a, you mentioned a preference card, say some of these things. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So basically what we did was get, to get surgeons together to say, okay, look, there are seven different devices that you can use to perform this procedure. You know, surgeon A uses this device that costs $87 and surgeon B uses this device that costs $380. Is there a way for us to meet in the middle or move down to surgeon A, you know, is cost. And there's some competition that you invoke between surgeons. And a lot of surgeons say, well, I use this because this is what I trained on. And this is surgeon says, well, well, I could show you how to use this. It's, it's very similar, you know, and, it, and the institution has a, a, a deal on this, you know, we, we get preferential pricing or whatever the situation is. And, and so just beginning to say, okay, if there's a really good clinical indication for this device, to be there, that makes sense. But perhaps if it's a preference item that is just sort of a, a whim or a comfort level that could be taught, educated through, then perhaps there's a way to save costs. And so we just started cutting high cost items. We started cutting things that were not, that were open, but unused. 
And that ended up causing that cost savings that ultimately that was the idea behind Explorer, the app was to do that on, a, on an institution wide level. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of what is the value proposition exactly for Explorer? So what was the value proposition when we started the company versus what was the value proposition when it, when it was sold? Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. That's how it works. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, yeah, that's the other, the huge lesson, right? Is that yeah. the, this, this baby that you birth out into the world ends up growing on its own if you're paying attention to the market and becomes something not what you thought originally. And so the idea behind Explore originally, and this is something that I still think there's a need. And honestly, it's something I'm, I'm currently working on at Vanderbilt is a way to minimize the the waste that occurs in the operating room. It, simply put, making sure that the tools that you need are delivered so that there's not time wasted trying to find the tools that you need and that the tools that you don't need are not delivered or not opened at least. And the tools that you might need are held in waiting if and when you need them. Basically getting the information that's stored in the surgeon's brain about how they know they're going to do something and the information that's stored in the brains of the nurses that are used to working on particular cases and and codifying it in a way that can be available to anybody. And this is particularly important now in a world of extreme use of traveling nurses, where you have nurses you've never worked with and have maybe new to the institution joining your team and like you can't expect them to know they know how to pass you stuff they know how to give you what you ask for which is great but they don't anticipate and they don't know what might not be needed or what special item might be needed and so we got to find a way to to provide that information you know that is scalable but the problem was with the original idea was it required a fair amount of interaction to use the app in the operating room and it required a lot of work to create the modules, you know, that had the surgeon's preferences in it. It was like a lot of hand work to do it. Was there any like observation? Are you using a camera to do any of this? Is this purely like everybody needs to be entering information and once that information is there, the system kind of runs itself, so to speak? Exactly. That It was more that. So we weren't automating any kind yet. You know, we, we thought we'd get there, but we were more like hand doing it. And, and so we, in the operating room, you basically have a step-by-step -step guide to the procedure based on the tools, tasks, Safety tips for given you know, parts of the procedure. There was a lot of bells and whistles we built in that I think were great, but didn't necessarily convince people to buy it. And what we found, and and I, you know, was that we had a lot of trouble convincing hospitals to see the problem. You and I, in preparation for this podcast, were talking about an interview that Jen gave, where she she talked about a a chief of surgery she was talking to who said, you know, these problems don't happen in our ORs, and she said, no. They happen in all the hours that are yours because you're the chief. And, and in fact, that, that turned out to be true, you know, and, you know, he became an investor in the company and we had surgeons who were sought immediately. They're like, this needs to happen. We want to invest. And that was, you know, initial funding, but we had so much trouble getting hospitals to, to want to buy it. And that's where we were failing. You know, it was just not going to be viable because no one wanted to pay for it. And in the work it would take to onboard a whole team you know, to use the new device to input all of their data in. And, and you know, we, we had not found ways to scale that efficiently. And that's when Jen, with the team that she built, had the insight of looking at vendors, suppliers, people who were making devices. And for them, it was a different value proposition because they were saying, okay, for us, it's, we don't care about waste or all the other parts of a procedure. But for our device, we want the person we're teaching to use our, you know, pacemaker to implant it the same way that, like, it was designed to be implanted. We want to be able to track how well they're doing in the case. We want to train them on it and have them bring this protocol to their team so their team's all on the same page and and that will improve the device outcomes. And it's, you know, it's a great use for a playbook. And you know, that became the the that became our customer were these manufacturers because they also could say, well, you know, we can support the the cost of the tablet devices that you know you run your app on. You know, we can build the modules because you know we're going to provide the information on what what steps and and tools and 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 our on our device that are needed. So it simplified the module creation. So with this, for example, would this be like you've got a pacemaker from a certain company A, and then you would be able to pull up this module and it would just say here are the steps involved in the procedure and here are some of the equipment that might be needed. Here's some that you keep in waiting, that type of stuff or? That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. It also saved the reps time because what's the usual protocol is you just call the rep in and be like, okay, no, remember, like, remind me, how do you, you know, whatever. And, and then on top of it, it, they also didn't need their reps to necessarily be monitoring it because the app could be used to collect certain data points on 
I'm like confirming that you used a particular setting or um, implanted the lead in a particular place or whatever, you know, your device called for. And then, you know, they began to say, well, this, this repless function is, is nice. I wonder if we can create a remote capabilities so the rep can just zoom into the operating room literally in case there's an issue yeah, yeah. and and that's because and, and i say literally zoom because we wrapped our app around zoom and that was in 2019 come 2020 when suddenly no one could go to the or unless you know you were the surgeon or the patient or the anesthesiologist this became a really valuable tool i want to give all the credit that's due to to jen for creating the amazing team that could pivot and provide this I'm proud of the the work that I did to come up with this idea that that ultimately morphed into this other yeah, idea. Yeah, right? hundred um, percent. It's the fire. But, it's it's basically like the the little spark that gets the fire going, and then you've got a little fire, and then you know it turns into a raging fire at some point. But the thing is that, like, what do you point to? Is like, what was the big success of the company? It was the pandemic. Yeah, you know, it was the sudden urgent need for this that got companies really excited. You know, and I've heard that story again and again. A, a good buddy of mine had a, a telemedicine company out in California, and they were struggling for a while. I mean, struggling to raise funds, you know, get out of Series A land. And then when the pandemic hit, they exploded, absolutely exploded. And he says the exact same thing. And we couldn't have done it without Jen and her team creating the environment that could that could respond to that. And also, I should not talk about. Explore without talking about Eugene Fine, who was our CTO that we hired very early on. And he was remarkable, remarkable human being and extremely good at what he did. And he was able to make those pivots quickly. And, and uh, Rob Steinman, who was you know, one of our uh, senior folks under Jen, really helped lead that team too. They were, they were all crucial. And I, you know, I was proud to be I was probably on the team, you know, and that's incredible. You know, I, and I want to say, I think for the physicians out there that might be thinking about being entrepreneurs, I'm not saying you can't run a company because you can, but that is its own skill set that's very different from from our skill set. And sometimes having recognizing that 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 is as much the success of a company as a great idea or a great product, and that you need to go into this with humility and recognize that you don't know and seek out mentors in business who can help you train you up so that you can speak the language and find partners that can you know help handle that aspect of you know, the necessary aspect of an entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think often the physician or the clinical person, nurse, staff, whoever, that is the initial seed for an idea, often we're really good at finding clinical problems. That's our strength is finding areas where there might be inefficiencies or, as you say, you know, waste or complications. We're really good at finding that and describing what that problem is. You know, once you kind of quarterback that and you've whittled it down, you've got some initial ideas on maybe a way to solve it. It's so important to bring in somebody who understands not just the technical side, of course, for whatever your solution is, but who understands the value side and, and how do you drive true value? You know, usually it's a business person who knows how to do that. It's often not us, but knows how to find that value that can be hidden, that can be hidden and needs to be unlocked. In your case, it sounds like, well, the value that's going to improve both, you know, patient outcomes is codifying steps to a procedure, making sure everybody's on the same page. And the value was hidden with the medical device companies, right? But, you know, also you're improving patient care by making sure these steps are all done in a standardized way. So those business people can be huge. I mean, they, I don't think it can be underestimated or understated how important having business people, at least as mentors early on, can be to help you find that value when you're primarily a clinician. Early on, when you know, when when I was the one pitching Explorer, right? And we're, we're doing these seed funds and innovation funds and and competitions. It made a lot of sense for a surgeon to be standing up there, being like, "This is a problem that I see every day in my own OR, and this is why we're solving it, and this here's all the data behind it, and this is why it's a good idea." And people were like, "Yeah, yeah, you know, this is this is something worth giving, you know, uh, some pocket change to help build out." And you know, this this was also how we wrote the STTR. We did an STTR tech through the National Science Foundation. So that was a grant mechanism, non diluted funding, which was great. And you know, so driving those. But then Jen had something like over a hundred investor calls before she found someone to to really invest wow. in the company. And I mean, that is. And she's speaking. She's speaking the language of. Uh, she knows exactly what to say. It can make you your more than your money back. You know, I can I can turn this into a viable entity that produces a profit, a return on investment, not just something that would be great for the world, 
Not that that's not important, and that's not that that doesn't motivate people like Jen who want to change the world in, in with their skill set. You also have to speak the language of the investors to be like, this is a safe investment. Right. This is an investment where you will get your money back. We will make you money, and you know, and it turns out she was right. You know, yeah, so, exactly. You know, I, that's I give her, I give her, I give her tons of credit for that. That is, that's incredible. I think that's a really good, really good point. I think. It's worth mentioning that it takes a long time to raise funding. And even somebody with such great experience and business, et cetera, speaking the right language, took 100, 100 calls to raise that funding. That's how it works. And you honestly, you have to flip the script. Instead of saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just wasted my time on 100 calls. It's not that. You have to change your brain to think, not only did I do 100 calls and every single call I took, my pitch got better. Exactly. Uh, my messaging got tighter. People started asking me the right questions that made me think of how I can improve the value proposition. I learned something. Yes, I learned something. exactly. Yes. You learned something that made you just tighter and stronger. You know, it's like the diamond formed under pressure, and that's exactly what it takes to form that. And not only that, let's say she had gone to 100 and, 101 calls. At some point, a no is a good thing because it's either going to tell you maybe we don't have the right idea, maybe we need to change or you're going to get to funding. And so no matter what, you're making progress with every single phone call, no matter what. And at least that's the way I look at it. Otherwise, I don't think I'd do, I'd do it either. <laughs> Alex Penlin, who runs the, or ran, I'm not sure if he still runs the Idea Lab at MIT, wrote this book called Social Physics, which is, I highly recommend, really neat book. One of the concepts he talks about in there is this concept of idea harvesting, where you're constantly pitching your ideas to other people by talking about what you're interested in, what you're working on. You know, it's not a pitch so much as just a conversation, right? But you're seeing what sticks. When you talk about something you think is important, people bounce back things to you that refine that idea over time. And that, that was the term he uses, is idea harvesting. And I think that's very much what you're describing with these, with these calls. It sort of tests it against all these other opinions. And, and it also, I think this really reinforces something that I've seen talked about in the entrepreneurship community and also seen it play out in, in both directions. That some people try to hold on they think their idea is like too good they don't want to talk about oh, it God. and it's technically it's true like if you had a really great idea and you happen to talk to somebody you could actually execute it on immediately like you have a you suddenly come up with this idea of a different way to wrist a surgical instrument and you happen to be meeting with someone from intuitive not under an nda and you're like hey what if you did it this way they could maybe execute on your idea you know that that's possible right but even even then, it's not likely because they're so busy with what they're doing. That's right. That's right. You know, I mean, you got to think entropy with everybody. Everybody's got their own problems and issues they have to deal with. But go ahead. And so there's, you know, well, yeah, exactly. So those unicorn events aside, right, the more you talk about the idea, the better it will get. It lives in the world. It does not live in your head. And I've got, I've changed the way I think about my IP, you know, in air quotes of the ideas I have is I want to talk about them. I want, you know, I'm careful about not publishing things that might be patentable without, you know, investigating the patent. That is something that's important for people to remember. But in the absence of creating a public disclosure of an invention, talking to colleagues about the problems that you're facing or trying to solve, what their pain points are, ideas that you might have and see, you know, how they respond to those. Those are really important conversations for refining an idea that you have that, that might someday turn into something. Having your idea stolen is so rare. It's just we raise it up and sound the sirens whenever that does happen so everybody hears it, right? But in reality, good luck trying to go take your idea that you think is so valuable. Yeah. <laughs> see if you can give it away. Like yeah. go try to give it to somebody and be like, I will give you this idea. Good luck with that. That will not happen. I'm telling you because you don't realize the amount of work it's going to take to get it to a full product is outside of most people's desire. Seven years later, yes. you know, they have a viable product. And you're like, okay. Nobody's going to steal your idea. Nobody's going to steal your idea, okay? It is much more likely you will fail by not talking to people than yes. somebody steals your idea. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. That was incredible. So right now, I'm going to run through a quick summary of just some ideas I, I jotted down while we were chatting. So number one, this was a theme throughout. Mentors are so important. Your initial mentor at Howard Hughes kind of really honed your integrity, it sounded like, which was really important with your OR device. Your surgeon mentors who helped you out after your clinical trial didn't turn out the way you thought. All the other surgeons who proposed that you should make a lab to study the OR. All of this is foundational in shaping your career. 
and the successes you've had. And it can do the same for everybody. I'd like to just add to that uh, just one thing, which is m- mentors can also be people who are younger and less experienced than you. And 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 that was these fresh eyes yep. that I consider, like I consider Emily Stockard a mentor through and through because she taught me to think differently. And even to this day, I have uh, one of our wonderful Vanderbilt residents is on my mentorship committee because she's a really interesting thinker and she knows things I don't. And she also has a perspective as me as an educator and as an attending from a, from a, the resident's point of view that allows her to have different insights in how I could improve my career. So, so again, I think having mentors from different fields and from above and below you and next door yeah. are all important. That's a really good point. And uh, that's awesome. Thank you for saying that. Next, clinical needs-based innovation. I think this is a theme also throughout. You went on, you went to look for problems, right? You were saying, where's the inefficiency? You even toured the country to see kind of how other surgeons handled the OR. This is basically needs finding from Stanford Biodesign and how important it is to make sure that you have a need with a there there, right? That there's actually a problem that needs to be solved. So you you did the work. I think it worked out very well. You don't know where you're, you know, this is another point. You don't know where this product or idea solution is going to go. You have no idea. All you know is you've got a problem and a problem area and you're learning as much as you can about it. You've got to trust that down that road, you're going to start getting feedback that's going to point your vision in the right direction because your vision that you started out with was not the vision that you ended with, right? And that's hugely, hugely important to understand is this this road is winding and the more you follow it and be open to things, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, and have fun with it while you do it. I mean, 100%. Would you do it again? Well, it's funny. I I used to joke that I wasn't going to start another company till the first one sold. Oh my God. (laughs) And then- Look at you. Yeah, right, right. I don't know if I would necessarily pick that path. I'd say what what's happened, what's changed is that I now can see how that path works, how that path could work, and where there might be other alternative paths that also follow a commercialization pathway, whether it's licensing a product, intrapreneurship, where you're you're starting programs internally and maybe building it out and then letting the institution take it from there. And so I'm, I'm experimenting with those models right now. I certainly, if, if I had a thing, I wouldn't be opposed to starting another company, but I think I'd go into it with eyes much more wide open about the commitment it requires, which is massive, massive, and honestly overwhelming to be a surgeon and try to even to have a second job, you know, and, and be a physician. I know you, Brian, appreciate that uh, as much as anyone, that, that it's hard to have a day job and a night job. And a family. And, yeah, and a family, right? And and, get, and give it your all. And that and that was that was a lot of stress in our in my marriage, you know, and my amazing wife, you know, Charlotte stood with me and let me pursue this crazy dream. And, and so you, I think I would also approach the ask that I'd be making of my family a lot differently <laughs> now that I know what it would entail. And so I think that also gives you some pause, you know, when you think about, should I do this? Or, or maybe there's, maybe someone else is better cut out for the day-to-day of a, of a startup and I can just kind of be here on the side helping out, you know, and that, that might be attractive. You can be an idea generator, right? You can be a guide, you can be an advisor, you can be any number of things that don't involve the day-to-day that is actually mountains of pressure built upon you. I love that. And it's really important to bring that in that this is this is tough to be a physician and an entrepreneur and especially if you have a family too. Their stress is out out of this world. So that's great. Really important to mention. And then you mentioned also I really like the questioning mind versus the hierarchical mind with Emily using the fresh eyes. That's huge. Always be open to these things and always ask questions. Try to bring in your fresh eyes if you can at every point because you'll see things that you didn't think about when you're, you know, in your training. Next is, I love the idea of chance encounters and co-localization and serendipity, increasing your luck surface area. I think that's throughout this, your, your career. I didn't coin increasing your luck surface area. I saw that, uh, you know, on Twitter, one of these guys said it, but it's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm taking it. I'm keeping it. Take it, (laughs) do it, do it, do it. Uh, there's a guy named Sahil Bloom who, who said that. I follow him. Yeah. He's great. He's great. He's awesome. So yeah, he's uh, basically, you went around to, to each surgeon's department. You just listened to what they said, and that leads to chance encounters. The IT gentleman, your Chris Radell, you know, kind of connected you uh, with the innovation fund. That's increasing your luck surface area. You said, I want to build a website, but you're also open to other things. That's huge. And I think I see that throughout. Your initial vision will change. You know, I mentioned that before, but it's so important. I think just having a vision is the key here. 
It is so important to start with a vision, whether it's right, wrong, doesn't matter. You have to have a vision that will attract people to your team. And you had a vision for improving waste and inefficiency in the OR that attracted Jen and others. They brought in their own version to it and dove into value and how do you drive value. And then, you know, you're off to the races with that. But having an initial vision is critical. You know, a lot of people take that for granted. But the second you started talking about waste and inefficiency, you were building a vision and that attracted people because they thought they could drive value for investors and patients and founders as well. So once an entrepreneur, your relationship with your institution can change. You mentioned this. So consider taking longer maybe to make the jump out of the research because you're protected there. You can iterate your product longer, work out the kinks. And before you're ready to go out and really be beholden to, you know, your investors and milestones and everything else. Just to respond to that, I think that, you know, particularly remembering that yeah, for a physician, clinician, entrepreneurs, this is your comfort zone, right? We've been trained in research. We've been trained to do clinical, hopefully, right? You know, yes. And so this is a safe space for us in a way that if you don't have the experience in entrepreneurship in the business world, not that you can't build that experience, but before leaping into that with no experience and then trying to manage things, which is ultimately what we ended up doing because of the, you know, that competition we entered that required a business. And then once you started a business, that starts the wheels rolling in, in the university's eyes. And so yeah, it does. Totally agree. And that's, it's, it's important to know, you know, it's a balance. You don't want to take too long. Okay. You don't want to take too long because then you can entropy and an, or inertia can set in and you just keep going in the same direction. The next thing I love is the fact that Jen had to go do 100 calls to raise funding. It takes time, folks. It doesn't matter how good your idea is, but don't look at that time spent as wasted time. You are stress testing your ideas. You are refining them. My pitches for Palmyra got so much better over time because people would ask hard questions that I'd be like, oh, I don't know crap. I, I don't know that. You need to go and figure it out so that you know the next time somebody's going to ask you that question. Or they're going to ask you, how are you going to make money? How are you going to make money? Who's going to pay you for this? You've got to answer those questions. And I loved your idea, the uh, the social physics book, Idea Harvesting. You're basically, I see it almost as the way AI works today, right? AI is not some magical thing. It's basically like, you know, it just, you get it gets feedback. It tries something, it gets feedback. It tries something, it gets feedback based on rules. And that's what this is. It's basically like the more you put an idea out there, you stress test it, you get feedback, you change it, it gets better. You change it, it gets better. By the end, the idea you have may be unrecognizable to what you started with and be infinitely more valuable because you got that feedback, which is a lot like AI. And then finally share your idea. I think don't be afraid that somebody's going to steal it. Make sure you file your IP, right? Protect yourself. Even if a back of the napkin file your provisional patent, it's like 140 bucks. Don't give public disclosures, but always be asking people. Don't say, oh, I can't, that's confidential. I can't talk about that. If you're a physician and you're saying things like that, the chan- you just raise your chances of failure probably 10x. You know, you've got to be out there sharing and be like, is this a good idea? You know, is, you know, what do you think about this, this? That's how you're going to find out if really there's something there. And you're greatly increasing your chance also for that luck surface area that somebody's going to say, you know what? I know somebody who works on, works on, have you talked to so-and-so? Yes. Have you, you, you got to talk to this person and it'll be your own institution, right? You'll talk to somebody, you know, you won't even know. Yeah. At some conference across the country and they'll be like, oh, do you know -know, so-and-so at your, at Vanderbilt? And I'm like, oh no, I don't tell me more. And, and so in fact, maybe the most important thing is meeting people, being that person is a, is a great thing to do for others is, is being the connector. And I think it's beneficial. And the more you're in the world, you do it, but, but also getting to know people who are, are connectors and have a, a view well beyond your own in a different sphere where they can begin to point you in directions you might you might not have thought of otherwise uh, very important oh i love that i love that view beyond your own because that's exactly what they do it's that's exactly what they do those connectors so that's fantastic you also recommended the book social physics with idea harvesting i'm gonna go read that now so that was awesome alex i had such a blast i really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all of your insights i think there's a lot to learn here Thanks, Brian. It was a treat. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. 
If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Arvijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lloyd Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.